All righty. Whoops, that's the wrong button. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to you all for the uh, Island Civilization uh, Socratic Seminar and Writing Lab. Um, hopefully you have the article in some form in front of you, whether it be a paper copy or the um, electronic copy of it, but we will be referring to that today. If you have not yet reached 3.5.4, that's where the writing task is. And so uh, if you want to make sure that you have your first draft in so that you can make sure to have a, a peer review, then you can have a writing lab document. Just write writing lab on a Google Doc and upload that for every assignment up to 3.5.4. Now, be careful because I did have a couple people, not in this class, but in another class, they thought, oh, that means I don't have to do those assignments if I go to the writing lab. No, you do. Um, it's just that for some people, they, they can do their thinking through the writing and they'd rather write first and then go back and do the thinking, and that's perfectly fine with me. So um, just, just get to 3.5.4, and that way you can make sure to get your essay turned in on time too. Okay, just to let you know, there's going to be three options in the writing task for this. The first one is you could write a letter to the author, um, kind of in the form of the letter to the editor. And it's basically agreeing or disagreeing with what this theory is. Then there's two essay prompts that you can choose from as well. Uh, the first one is which of the four scenarios is most likely to happen. And then the second is how much the pre how much is the present generation responsible for preserving the environment and the planet for future generations. He brings up that point as well. So you can choose one of those three topics to focus on for this task. Uh, here's a closer look at what the prompts actually say. So the purpose of the letter to the editor of this assignment is for you to interact through writing with the author of, his re of this reading, acknowledging that there is a real person behind these ideas. In your letter, you should summarize and acknowledge Nash's, Nash's major points. Then you should respond to him taking one of these stands, support his view, challenge his ideas, or present your own thoughts on the topic. And actually, I think you could do all three. The audience for these letters will be your teacher and your classmates, as well as Dr. Nash. Your purpose as a writer is to write persuasively enough to convince the author of this text that you have thoughtfully engaged with his ideas and that you have the ability to present your own opinions on this topic. So that's the first option. Then the uh, first essay option is taking into account what you know of human nature in our current society. Which of Nash's four scenarios is most likely to happen? The wasteland, the garden world, the primitive world, or the island civilization? Or do you think there is another alternative that is more likely? Write an op-ed essay, op-ed meaning an opinion piece that usually goes on the opposite page from the newspaper's own editorials, that argues for your view of what will happen, why it will happen, and what we should do about it. Then the third option, essay B, one of the ethical issues inherent in Nash's argument is how much the present generation is responsible for preserving the environment and the planet for future generations. Is it wrong for us to engage in practices that make us rich and happy now, but will cause economic and environmental damage for our descendants? Using the Nash presentation as an example of what might happen in the future, write an op-ed essay that defines how much responsibility we bear for the quality of life of future inhabitants of our world and what, if anything, we should do to fulfill our responsibilities. So knowing what these three topics are, uh, we are going to discuss each component of that so that hopefully by the end you'll have a good idea of what you want to do for the writing assignment. So let's start by um, defining what Nash means by wilderness and what he means by civilization. So, so who wants to kind of explain what Nash says it should be the definition of wilderness and civilization. Um, I forget what Nash says is um, 
it's wilderness that it's whatever we want to make of it. So if we wish to make it scary and dark, we are allowed to do so. And that's what we did in the beginning. We made it as a punishment. Um, something we don't want to go there. It's dark, there's no warmth, there's no help, help there's no protection, it's not safe. And then once we came up the city civilization, it became a place peaceful. It became a serenity. It became you walked in and you felt the soft breeze of air flowing through your hair. Mm -hmm. You can touch the moss and you can feel the la the life going through, the love and all the like all the nature around you. So yeah. this wilderness is telling us that it is what we make of it and we choose the idea. We um we create what we want. Very good. Anybody want to add to that? <clears throat> I kind of fit when I first read this the first thing that came to my head was if a tree falls in the forest you know that that saying that if a tree falls in the forest and nobody is there to hear it does it make a sound and I think that's what this is all about is that as as she said we are defining it so that Civilization is a structure, and the wilderness is unstructured, anything unstructured. So it's, uh, but that's exactly correct. It's what we make of it. Now, the question is, what does Nash make of it? At the beginning of paragraph three, he mentioned that it's a state of mind. So he also mentioned how wilderness didn't necessarily exist before civilization because having a safety of civilization and made wilderness become wilderness because people weren't inhabiting that area and animals were like running wild. Okay. So it's like a state of mind for humans is what he's trying to say. So Samia, what is, uh, did you want to... Well, I'll just say that like... Um, uh, another time, like, missing the other, like, um, people, like, um, species of Right. It's like going back to what we were doing, like, like, it goes back to the one, um, art that he did about the hospital and the patient, like, um, of the last meow? Yeah. 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 <clears throat> and so in Nash's mind, the wilderness needs to be separate and away from us. Do you agree with that? Yeah. It doesn't have to be. Is that what you said? Yeah. Why not? Okay. What's the benefit of co coexisting with it? Like, it really depends. Can we like, study the stuff if we're separate from it? As effectively, mm -hmm. not enough. Okay. It doesn't go into much detail. It's only like three paragraphs long. Okay. Three paragraphs. It's a lot more than three paragraphs. Okay. Four, <laughs> three, five. That's more like what? Thirty? Uh, Twenty-eight. Yeah. No. 28. I'm oh, saying you mean his, his proposal. His, his proposal. Okay, I get or it. Or the fourth. Right, and we'll get to those. You're right. They're very short. He spends the first part of this discussing the history of how we define wilderness and civilization, the, the westward expansion and, and all that good stuff. Um, and then he comes down to the just the little tiny four scenarios, yes. Um, Anybody else want to respond to this? Do you agree with his basic definition of wilderness and civilization? And in that, if civilization impacts wilderness, then we should be separated. You agree with that? Yeah. Why? I don't know. I feel like civilization, civilization is never good for wilderness. I don't know. It's just, I feel like they should be apart from each other, like you can visit it. Okay. Every once in a while, it depends on the people. Because some people like hate animals, hate everything. They just want everything to be normal in their mind. I guess normal in their mind is like having everything survive. You know, like 
phasing is happening, even though, like, even the end evaluation is still, I don't know, it's just okay. a crazy topic. Um, it is. And I think a lot of it has to do with this idea of occupancy of the Earth in the fourth millennium. So, you know, we're looking at 3020, the year 3020. Can you picture that? Can you go that far into the future in your head? Um, I think the only way we might be able to do that is if we look at what was civilization, as we understand it, what was it like in 1020? What was it like a thousand years ago? And and when you look at, at, at how that difference has occurred, does it, uh, does it continue on? Are we going to somehow fall, is there going to be some kind of a change? What do you guys think out there in Google Hangout land? Is there, uh, do you believe that, um, that the future that's coming is doomed or it's uh, going to be exciting? Uh, what do you think? Um, I think that the future is what you make of it. If you wish to choose the damnation for the future, then, um, Please keep drinking out of the plastic water bottles and throwing them on the ground, throwing them in the wrong trash bin. Um, keep on throwing trash on the ground. But if you wish to um, see it as, I'm not throwing trash on the ground, I'm not, I'm drinking out of the water bottle because it helps someone get a job in a factory. Mm -hmm. Then you don't think the future's down. You're like, oh, I'm helping, I'm helping it. I'm getting to a job. It's all what you make of it. Okay. Anybody else? If we continue with how we're treating the Earth now, the Earth will not be the same as it is now. As nature probably will cease to exist and will be more fake, and future generations won't be able to experience Earth as it is now. We can't even experience Earth as it was 100 years ago for all the buildings and the industries that have become. So if we really think about the past and we just triple that due to our new technology, that's how the earth is going to be unless we make changes. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. In paragraph 12, uh, Nash brings up John Locke's social contract. And it says uh, this contract mandated restrictions on individual freedom in the interest of creating a sustainable society so an ecological contract might restrain the human species in its relation to the ecosystem. Basically what he's saying is he agrees with John Locke's uh, theory that we must, what, go ahead. They, they, right, they need to be separated. So if the human element is going to impact that ecology, then we have a responsibility to stop what we're doing to preserve that ecology or that ecosystem. What do you guys think of that? Do you believe that we are under a social contract, that there is this underwritten social contract that we must um, preserve and maintain the ecological system as we know it, even if it means sacrificing um, not necessarily people's lives, but their livelihoods for this. What do you think? I feel as if that is completely true. We are here not to take things for ourselves, but to be part of a chain, be part of an ecosystem. Just like every other creature on this earth, we have a part to help it or to hurt it. In the jungle, there's the king, and then there's the itty bitty, the itty bitty bugs. But they all help each other, whether they like it or not. The bug it creates the fertilization for for the plant. It cleans the plant. We didn't have those. We wouldn't have anything, right? Mm -hmm. So we can't survive without the rainforest. If there's no rainforest, there's no water is a spread of nutrients, everything begins to die. We will begin to die. And so if we, we want to continue life, 
we need to put down our ideas of comfort, our ideas that what we want is what we need. We need to realize that nature is what we need. And if we don't have that, we will have nothing. It's like building a house on a faulty foundation. It won't work. If you have to build your idea on a bunch of old water bottles, your house is going to fall. But if you want to build your idea with nature, the one who has survived millennium until us, you choose. But be careful. Who else? Who else would like to respond to that? Here's, here's a question, and in our community right now, we still have quite a bit of oil that, that stains our community, but we know that that's a resource that is going to run out soon, and we also know that, that because of the way that we extract it, it can do damage to parts of our environment. Should we therefore uh, abandon that as a resource and find a new resource, even though it may cost a lot of people jobs? Yeah, because it's either your job or your life. If you want to work for another 50 years, go ahead, but there's not going to be an extra 100 years left for your grandchild. Or your great grandchild, they won't be alive. They won't be able to see anything. They won't be there. So, Mia, what yeah, it's, is, do, it's, do you believe each generation has an obligation to the next to do what it can to preserve the resources? I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, we should because there's always going to be a different job to do. Like, people out in here are doing illegal stuff. So, basically, anyone can make up a job. Like, you can literally do um, anything. Like, you can do it on your phone and make money. Like, there's people make money off of anything. So, if they do cut off people working and having their jobs in their life, the, un the, employment, the unemployment rate will decrease, but our civilization and global is going to Okay. But does that help if the people don't have a, a way of making a living? Um, it will harm others that they will leave out. And, um, I mean, it provides, so like, if they're off the oil field, we can, like, move more people to things like solar companies and wind companies, and those are safer jobs, even. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know if they pay as much, I haven't done that, but they're safer, and they still give you money. Like, probably won't be as many positions available, but there's more to work if you remove like an oil industry. I mean, they pay a lot. It's just the field is oil filled and electricians are like going to the thing. You've got a lot of money. So that's why like this would be talking about like oil filled, all that crap that's murder. And then you have to be careful all that crap. Uh, they pay you a lot in oil filled there because you can get your arms chopped off. Yeah. Like, in long so, hours too. Yeah. You get $100,000 a year. I learned all that from my dad. And then he just moved up because he knows basically everything. He had to go back to school, study electricity, a lot of crap, and then switch to go to the plants like that, big plants, a lot of crap, to things like fill meters and all that stuff. And he made tons of money off of that. It's just time. Okay. <clears throat> so, and you brought up the alternative solutions, but again, it is, and, and by the way, the wind turbines, very, also very dangerous to work on very dangerous to work on the one thing they're way high up in the air they can get hit by them. and they can get hit by them and uh, their wind turbines hello there's wind up there and, um i watched i actually it was on the weather channel of all places uh the how the the people who work on on servicing those wind turbines so how dangerous that job can be but it it does become you know what do we leave for the future generation do we have that obligation 
to leave that future that future generation a place where they can live and sustain themselves. How much how much do we have in terms of that responsibility? What well, do you there think? has to be sacrifices. Basically, that have to be made for future generations to like succeed in life. I guess you say, like how the person is. Okay. Mr. Short, did you want to jump in on any of this? No, I think we're doing a great job. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Short. Um, John has added to the little chat too, though. Oh, okay. Let's go back to that then. Uh... <laughs> okay. Yeah, I can't see the chat. Okay. We have to um, move to the side and there'll be a little. Okay, so Madison says, I do think we need to start thinking clean and we need to preserve our environment. I think we do need to start using resources that will not harm. We need to stop thinking of the earth as something we own rather as something we need to help thrive. It's a good way of putting it. And uh, I had mentioned in this morning's session, back in the early 70s, there was this huge campaign uh, to fight pollution, and um, there's one very iconic uh, um, commercial, Iron Ice Cody, who turns out to be Italian and nowhere near Native American, but he, he it was a role that he played, and then it just kind of became him, but he's rowing in a canoe, and there's garbage all uh, scattered in the, in the lake that he's rowing his canoe in, and uh, it was a big push to stop the pollution, to make sure that the next generation would have a place that they could live and uh, survive. And we have done that. Um, there's a lot of regulations now, and there's still companies that complain about them. Um, they've also said that the smog levels have come down, even though we haven't seen it. We, you know, being in the valley, we kind of get it all, it gets dumped in our valley. So I don't think we'll ever get out of that. But we have been on that road, and I think more and more people are learning to do that. And, um, you know, as you mentioned earlier with the, with the water bottles, uh, this district, the high school district, now has all these different, um, instead of giving out all these bottles of water, we have these water, filtered water machines. You just bring your own bottle and you get that. So we're doing it. We are doing it. And then Allah said, I think that our actions today matter a lot and affect our future generations, whether they are good or bad, and it's our choice to help or make it worse. And again, it, I am, I'm not sure who said it. Uh, who was the one who said that it's our personal choice and we ha it starts with us? Who said that? I think that was Emily. Emily, okay. Yes, that's, I think that's where we need to be. Does Nash say that at all? Is there anything about Nash where he says that? He doesn't say it himself, but it is, um, I think it's in either 10 or 11 where he cites a book where they, they do say um, something like that. Sand County Almanac. Uh, wildlife ecologist Aldo Leopold became the major American articulator of what is called the land ethic. It is significant that wilderness preservation was one of Leopold's highest priorities. It constituted, Leo, Leopold argued, an act of natural, national contrition on the part of a species notorious for biotic arrogance. I love that, biotic arrogance. Um, and that is, you know, it doesn't matter what we throw into the environment, uh, just as long as we're making money. I think that's what he's referring to there. Um, a new 1960s word, environmentalism, took a broader view of utility, gave rise to the term pollution, which impacts many species, and added momentum to the idea of the rights of nature. And uh, so, of course, by the 70s, it would have reached that pinnacle. And I think what we have seen, um, I think another thing that helped contribute to that was the Three Mile Island accident. 
um, nu the nuclear power plant that had a spill, and uh, that was in Pennsylvania. It went into the groundwater, and there are still some effects felt today. Chernobyl had the same kind of accident. The ironic part was they made a movie called The China Syndrome, which was about a nuclear power plant that basically had a leak. <laughs> that uh, seven days after it was released was when that Three Mile Island accident happened. So I think all of that kind of contributed to um, this awareness that we need to be careful with, with the resources that we have and, and what we're doing with them. Okay, anything more on this social contract? Anything that you want to ask about or talk about? Because I, this is really the key here of Nash's theory, is that we have this obligation to the environment. Yep, you have something or yep, you agree? You agree, okay. <laughs> Alrighty, so let's go ahead and move on to the four scenarios here. Uh, the first one is in paragraph 15, he refers to as the wasteland scenario. This one anticipates a trashed, poisoned, and used up planet that can support, support only a pathetic remnant of its once miraculous biodiversity and civilization. So what you know of this one what do you think? How possible is this solution in the year 3020? 25 percent. How did you arrive at your, your number? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like, I just said, okay, it was 5 percent, and then plus 20 percent for the new natural. Okay. Um, Right. I thought you just said 25% because it was four scenarios. <laughs> um, that's why. Anyway, um, nuclear power. Are we still using that to a great extent? Yeah, How? Because uh, I'm not a good scientist. Any STEM people around here? Do we have any STEMs out there? Science, technology, engineering, mathematics? Used to? Um, Mr. Short, you just went to solar power. Can you tell us why? Are we all there? Are you there, Mr. Short? He's probably helping another student. Okay. Um, he was talking this morning about how he had moved to uh, solar power. And so the solar panels, yeah. And so that means that, you know, there's electricity that he can essentially give back to PG&E. Um, Hi, I'm back. Now you're back. <laughs> Now you yeah, know I check I, and make sure they I had a question, so okay. I had to help that student. No problem. Um, I was telling them how you had just recently installed solar panels. Can you tell us yeah. what was the behind that decision or what was the motivation behind that? Well, um, you know, it, it was a good decision all the way around. Uh, primarily because I feel like we wanted to do something that was positive for the environment. And on top of that, there were economic um, booms, I guess you can say, mm -hmm. that um, came along with our decision to do this. Um, it was actually quite expensive. Um, but when you, when you think you're going to pay that much money in power anyways over the course of the life of the, of the um, of, of the solar panel, and you'll get more use out of the solar panel than that, mm -hmm. then it's kind of like a no-brainer because um, you get to help the environment, you get to give energy back to the environment, or back to the um, power company. Mm -hmm. um, you get actually compensated for that, and it's clean energy, you know, so you don't have to, you know, 
think twice about some um, um, coal burning unit somewhere polluting the atmosphere because you're doing your part to create electrical energy. Right. And I think too with the, um, since we seem to head in that direction, especially, you know, you guys have been around as long as we have, but so, because in the 70s it was looking a little like this wasteland scenario. But I think we are getting a little better when it comes to uh, cutting down the emissions in, in these industries and whatnot. Yes, there's still accidents, but I think that there is a, a, a common agreement that we are responsible for the area around us. What do you think? Or do you think that there's still this mentality out that, that, that if companies are making money, it doesn't matter what they do to the environment? Okay, you can do both. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, another thing that I mentioned earlier is that when you look at a lot of the science fiction movies that were from 50s, 60s, 70s, Wasteland Scenario, I'm thinking of Blade Runner. Has anybody seen Blade Runner? That's that society, that Wasteland Society. And so I think that was the one that really seemed to scare everybody. Stephen King, when you look at it, or uh, the Stand and Dark Tower series, you know, that's what he sees. T.S. Eliot wrote the poem, The Wasteland, same kind of thing. But I think maybe we, we took the warning and maybe we're headed in a, a different direction. Okay, the next one. Now, uh, we can't play the audio on this because we're in Google Hangouts, but a little later on, you, can, you have the chance of clicking on that uh, little picture. There was a movie that came out late 60s called Silent Running. And what this is, is the uh, movie trailer for it. So it's it's something for you to take a look at later. But um, it this is the garden scenario. You want to know all about the garden scenario, uh, see if you can find Silent Running. It's kind of a goofy little movie. Uh, basically, it's about uh, this is a scientist who because the earth has gotten to the point where it can produce everything synthetically that they've taken out all the gardens and all the um, vegetation and they've had these kind of mobile space units these bubbles where they still grow things naturally and bruce stern is one of the ones who he's one of the scientists there there's a couple of these goofy little robots that help him but they decide that they no longer need those facilities so they're just going to blow them up and these guys have to come back home. And he doesn't want that to happen because it's the last of the way that you can grow things naturally. And so that's the garden scenario. I'm pretty sure this was the idea. He probably took it from, from this movie. As Nash writes, our species has occupied and modified every square mile and every planetary process from the oceans to weather to the creation and evolution of life. It is finally, as some feared, all about us. In his garden scenario, we manufacture everything that we need. There is no wilderness left. What do you think? Do you think that this is a possible scenario in 3020s? How possible is it? I think that path is completely impossible. There's no way we can make all the little organisms needed to do this. Mm -hmm. The reason why we have an ecosystem and the reason why it lasts so long is because it works. Mm -hmm. If we didn't need it, it wouldn't be here. And to suggest that humans can create millions upon millions upon millions of different nano-like nano organisms to help us continue to live, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable. It's absolutely impossible. Okay. Every part of what we have and what and what there is is because of everything. We what we are is well, excuse me, um every little thing on this planet has a job. Mm -hmm. And 
our job are to manage our the, the workers. We help them. We, if there's too much air, we breathe in the oxygen. Some of them, there's not, there's not so much oxygen, so we all focus on it. Mm -hmm. We, the trees produce oxygen and we take the oxygen and we are to it with all of them in the cycle. If it's too much, the trees would all die out. We have our job and part of it is not only to take what we are given, but also to take what we are given and give back in a peaceful manner. So having this idea of humans taking everything and dominating what we all have and making it, um, um, what's the word? I can't forget the word, but not real, manufactured is yeah. impossible. Synthetic, of course. Synthetic, yeah. I think you could technically synthesize everything, but I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's likely for it to happen. But you could. Well, and, it, and let me throw this at you. <clears throat> we have an overproduction of corn. Because what have we done with the corn? We have modified it so that it's now what? What what is in virtually every soda, every sweetener, corn syrup, what? High fructose corn syrup, and that they have found that that is probably one of the one of the causes, if not the leading cause, of the obesity problem in the United States because. They're in the sodas now, right? And that's why it make, they make such a big deal about that Pepsi and that Coke now made with real sugar. Well, it's been made with real sugar for years until we get into this overproduction of corn, and and um, and and then they were trying to use it as a fuel source, and that was just stupid. <laughs> so, I mean, we it, there have been attempts at it, but I think we realize what happens in that we cannot duplicate when we do try and produce things synthetically that it's not going to be the same. We want to be more effective at doing what we wanted it to do. We wanted it to produce that. Right. And we were able to get it to do that. Like we can do that with anything, really, if we genetically modify it. And it's only going to get better and better with new technology. True. And when he says, again, this is uh, Nash, with this garden scenario, uh, what was it about the animals? Um, he had said that the only animals are those that we, oh man, where did it go? Oh, I'm, I'm in the wrong paragraph, that's why. So we're in 16. All the animals around are those we eat. Right. So we're only breeding those that actually become a product of some kind, and and so we're losing these other animal species. I know we're not eating them, are we? <laughs> Thank goodness for that. I love my dogs. I wouldn't eat them. Well, this is the only way for us to to nature is to allow it to do its work. And um, whenever something is in the environment, it's like the same thing as the same thing as the apple. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Yeah, because uh, gala apples, I think, are, are a recent species, like within the last 20, 30 years. They, they, they used to not have galas, but they were specifically created. I forgot what was crossed breed them, but yeah. So is it a bad thing if we are able to produce these and therefore it disappears from wilderness? Is it a bad thing? Well, I mean, to get rid of wilderness entirely, like as, as far as I would understand, if you don't have wilderness anymore, is it, or was it, I'm not sure what the I, garden scenario is specifically referring The garden scenario is there is no more wilderness. We have created it all. So Think like, Jurassic like, Park. 
<laughs> I mean, so like everything's still good. There's grass everywhere. Pigs are still happy. I think I'll be happy. <laughs> because we still like bacon, right? No. <laughs> Happy there. <laughs> being friends. Being friends, being happy I mean, pigs, Charlotte's web. Okay. All right. Future primitive. This is my favorite one actually. Um, because I've kind of seen hints of it. Uh, paragraph 17, he talks about the future primitive that involves writing off technological civilization as a 10,000-year bad experiment. Either by choice or necessity, small numbers of humans resume, resume the kind of hunter and gatherer existence that indeed worked quite well for our species for millions of years. Right. Because... <laughs> I'm going to, and, and here's why. Uh, I believe it was in 2008, power grid blew in Canada. And that power grid powered New York City and some other places too, but New York City specifically. For 18 hours, they had no power. The entire city was shut down. No uh, subway trains, no phone access at all. Landlines, maybe, but when you figure how many are hooked into the satellite system and they're powered by electricity, they're not working. So no communication, no transportation, uh, no refrigerators. The food was, you know, so the food might have spoiled. Obviously, you're not going to have somebody cook the food for you, and you're not going to go home and cook it. It was chaos. You would have thought that it was on the get -go. Same kind of thing with the Y2K. Um, when that the, the the big scare of Y2K was that when computers were programmed, it was only done within the 20th century. So when it hit the century mark, they were afraid everything was going to go back to the year 1000 and everything would be lost. Then a lot of people had crazier notions of what happened after that. So that's why it would be a small number who in this conversation so out there in google land and and here how many of you could survive if you were suddenly without anything powered by electricity for your lifetime you could i get lost constantly so. <laughs> I like the idea. I've always like watched the movie. Where they have the test paper around. Oh, that's cool. Right. Um, did they know it was going to be 18 hours? or did they No. They, they had, when they first found out, we have no power, and they couldn't figure out how to turn it back on, they were panicking. And there were people running and screaming everywhere. It was like a horror movie. I mean, I feel like everybody should be put, should be put in situations such as that so we're not like panicking or like. Freaking out and stuff just because mm -hmm. power turned off. Like, uh, like we, our like species have survived like without it for like so long, and then it just came into our. Oh, it really happened. It was like it was like, you know, a, a, the power shut off, and nobody knew what to do. It was it was chaos. It's like a wind siren drill, but instead of power out the drill. It, yes. And it was out. no drill. This is not something that anybody practiced for. Yeah. They wouldn't have known. I don't think that anyone in this Google chat room or anyone in that room could survive without power more than maybe a week or so. I bet you not one of you I, can <laughs> find an actual animal. Yeah. You're willing to literally kill it. You have to kill it. You have to lift the animal in its eyes. It's not a cow you get from a factory. It's not a goat you get from a factory. You must lift the animal in its eyes. I do take its life away, right? Yep. You must be able to kill this animal. You must be able to hang it by its feet and drain it from its blood. Be able to take that meat off its bones and cook it and eat it for dinner like there was nothing. Yeah. All in a span of time, from breakfast to dinner, you must do that to survive. 
Not I'm going to hang out. Do that. I'm not actually hanging out find, with Asher because Asher not, can do it. <laughs> not one of you can find berry. One of you know what poison ivy looks like. Oh, yeah, I've gotten seven. Seven, metal, seven. No. Yeah, and we have somebody here, definitely. Asher is a Asher is a hunter. He likes being out there. And, uh, yeah, I'm hanging but out with Asher. I'm not going to help you, but. Think about that. One in a group of ten can survive. But I could also survive. And most of you think, you, you know what? She's wrong. I can do it. I bet you if I tell her enough, right. I can do it. Maybe you can, maybe you can't, but the possibility of you able to like slim to none. I mean, it's me and my dog. I mean, I know how to, I know how to, I know how to fend for myself. I know what all these things look like. I know how how things work. Right. You're also finding ready to go. Right. But not even I think I could do it. I have to politely disagree. Okay, go for it. I mean, you have to take and life from an animal that goes in a factory. I don't even eat meat. That's how, like, like, I don't even care to drive. I mean, I wouldn't kill animals. I would just, like, there's still probably, like, farm fields near me or whatever that I could ransack. No, I mean, like, if you put on Earth where, like, everything's fairly, like, But those, all those farm fields are genetically like, modified. Yeah, they I do not, not lose the peace. One season, and like, those, those, all that corn is gone. It has one season of life. Yeah. All those peaks are gone. So, so, but you would know how to replant it. Yeah. If you're not reproduced and if you're not put this seed, that's okay, what you have to do. Okay, how about I run an idea by you guys? Okay. All right, let's, let's give Margaret a chance here. Go Why, for it. What if you team up with someone that likes to hunt, someone that likes to cook, someone that likes to clean, <laughs> <laughs> all these little things, well, at least and you don't have out. to worry about doing, <laughs> and you don't have to worry about doing all of it, because realistically, nobody would want to do all of it in that situation, so you are right by saying that nobody realistically would want to do all of it. Maybe everyone but... <laughs> <laughs> but like, funny. so like, if let's say right now it all started to happen, of course we would all team up with him because right. we want to survive. But we'd also have to figure out where is he going to find the meat? And then I'd be going home saying, that's my dog, you can't have my dog. Oh, yeah, okay. What? I could what, eat a dog. What do you provide for him? What do you get? practically nothing. You can clean a den, so can he. All he needs is to eat that you meat and have a place you can to make, sleep. That's all he needs. He you doesn't need shelter, you to make, help him survive. He can do it on his own. So if I, my grandparents I, have cabins up in the mountains with plenty of animals to hunt, and my mom grew up hunting deer, killing them, and eating them for dinner, so I think we'd be pretty set up. <laughs> Let's you see know, if all to the 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 not they can survive. People are willing to adapt in change with the environment if we were all thrown like no electricity like anything that we really have today you're like yeah we are going to freak out because change but you also have to assume that people will adapt and change or else we actually just wouldn't be here today because that's what we've been doing our entire life so that's just my favorite. That is now what we have been doing. Our ancestors did it. Our ancestors took the meat. They took the water. They were able to grow. We? I I can figure out how to change the tire. I can figure out how to build a boat. Yeah, I do not know how to build a boat. Yeah, right. But they could. They understood what it took to live. We don't. We have the luxury of this. Well, we have the luxury of this century. And that's would, why it's the small but, numbers. So that's why Nash refers to it as the small numbers, because, you know, truly how many of us could survive? We can come up with a lot of different what if scenarios, but. Yeah, we wouldn't be able to reproduce. Right. But so, so do you see this happening by 3020? No. It's like a zombie. No, no one would let it happen. Never gonna happen. Right. Thank you for saying that. I'm so glad you said that. You're, You're the first young person I've met, uh, in fact, the first older person I've met, who said <laughs> it's not going to be a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> Which, by the way, Nash leaves out of this. So, um, okay. Well, technically, say like the sun hits us with one of those burst things that right. takes out all the power, then it could happen, but that's right. still unlikely. Kind of. Or World War III. Yeah, but like at that point, you're all dead. <laughs> yeah, 
Okay. The last one, and this is Nash's personal philosophy, his theory. The island civilization where boundaries are drawn around the human presence, not around wilderness. Advanced technology permits humans to reproduce their environmental impact. What it means. You know, how, how did you interpret it? means we are in a city like like we are now and then the animals are somewhere else mm -hmm. on an island how they are and how we're on the island well, okay. so that means that we don't go to them that means no more camping no more fishing unless it is manufactured within our city you know you can go to the the, the water park and do some fishing with fish that we've grown there just specifically for that purpose. Uh, no cross country travel on the roads, probably. Um, I'm not even sure if airplanes would be allowed. You know, if you're flying over it, does it still impact the environment? So what do you think? Do you think this is something we are responsible for doing that we should do and could be in place by 3020? I think this scenario, it's a good idea, don't get me wrong, but it's flipping the rules. We are now the animals. We are now the container. We are now no longer available. How long do you think it's going to last? Not very long. People have the need to want. They need that. They need to want. If we don't want them. You want to go outside, right? You want to wake up. You need, you need to have a want. So how long do you think it is for someone to need to have the want? Yeah, that sounds like I'm about to suit, but how long do you think it's for someone to need to have the want to take the hand? It's not, it's an animal. What are they going to do? It's, I'm the, I'm the superior being. I want it. I'm going to take it. And that is our idea now. What was I there earlier? I mean, like during um, pioneer time, right? We had this small section of home. It was nice, right? And the boundaries were the scary animals until we broke the boundaries. Now, how long is it going to take for us to break those boundaries again? Do we have, what, are there boundaries left to break? No. Except if you want to go to the after the ocean, but that's the boundary, but it's another story. Well, yeah. That, well, here's the ironic part. I talked about this earlier. The author of this module, his name is Dr. Chris Street, he teaches at CSU Fullerton. He and I are actually doing, uh, we're putting ERWC online. Uh, that's a different story. We were presenting in Denver, Colorado, and my husband and I decided to drive because they didn't want to pay for me to have two tickets for a seat, so I said, I want to drive anyway. And we drove from Bakersfield to Denver, took two days, and it was gorgeous. If you've ever been, we went through, so, okay, California, Las Vegas, not so gorgeous. But once we get into the corner of Arizona and the rock formations are just red, they are a red you've never seen before, it's beautiful. And then getting through the Badlands in Utah, I mean, it's, it's, the, the Grand Canyon may be huge, yes, but when you go into the Badlands of Utah, you've got a whole thing to look at. Just all of these different formations. It was beautiful. And the entire road was bounded by barbed, uh, sing, well, two barbed wire, basically. Wasn't all that, you know, it wouldn't be a big threat, but obviously it said, don't go here. When we get into Denver, so we're driving and you're coming out and then you go and you see Denver. It looked exactly like this. That's what Denver looks like in the middle of that beauty. And when I finally caught up with Dr. Street, I said, here's the irony. We just, because this was last year in April. So we had just finished Island Civilization. And I said, you know what? I think we're already there. We already live like because there was nothing, 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 nothing for miles until suddenly we get to Denver and it looks exactly like that. I think we're there already. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
sort of bunch of humans on an island all together and kind of stuck together, I think the crime rate would go up. I mean, like, what do we do with all the prisoners? Like, throw them off the edge? Because if there is a jail, there still can be jail breakouts, and I just think it will lead to chaos, and it just won't turn out well. Okay. Samia, what were you saying? Like, yeah. And you can't trap a wild alligator and not expect it to bite. Samia, go ahead. I feel like people are waiting to the point where technology is advancing more, where it's at a point where it's going to be more advanced than humans. And then they're going to be like cars, flying, possibly, but not building. Most of it, I think it's flying. It's like on a, like, you know, like Hawaii is an island. It's like a created island where it has like the structure all below it probably. I don't know if it's like... It's limited. our movement that's limited. It's our movement that's limited. I mean, I it, it would I would assume Nash is saying, you know, making the boundaries so that we are somewhat comfortably living within them. But, the, but we are the ones, as she said, it's flipped. We're the ones that are caged yeah. rather than how we have caged animals or, or something like that. We as humans are even comfortable with farms we are big and we are big in the entire earth. We're not comfortable with that. We decided to build a spaceship and break the brown break that boundary one more time mm -hmm. up into space. Right. So humans with their own self will never be content with what they have. We always will have greed. And the idea to ignore the greed is impossible. Mm -hmm. We have to acknowledge the grief and we have to be able to break it down and not confine us so that it won't stop us. Me personally, I don't mind staying in my house all day just playing video games and being out there and yet that's all I do is sitting there. But like a lot of people they they have to be there but I don't know. You really do need some fresh air now and then time. <laughs> Mrs. Gamble? Yes. Um, well, I don't think it would be very dynamic, but if we had that island civilization, um, what if Mother Nature just wanted to get rid of us all and just made an earthquake on that island civilization and put us all together? Well, earthquakes are based on the tectonic phase. But that. it's usually. Yeah. yeah. It would be, I don't know if it, it would be, I don't think it would be an earthquake. It would be like, you can just tsunami over there. Maybe the oil. Well, uh, Earthquakes like, can cause, they do cause yeah. tsunamis. The, the, and, um, you know, this, the, it's sort of related to the global warming. Um, I, when Nash originally did this, and Dr. Street has revised this, uh, I haven't put it together yet, though, I, but uh, he, has give, he, has, um, he has brought in some new sources that I hope to get to next year, but uh, so 2008, yeah, I guess global warming was, was kind of important by then. But the thing is, is it man that can cause something like global warming or is global warming just part of the natural life cycle of the earth? What do you think? No. I will agree that global warming is a part of the life cycle of the earth, but we sure did help it speed along. The Earth, one day, will, one day, and you don't have to agree, but one day, the Earth will restart, like it with the dinosaurs. A meteor hit it, became filled with dust and uninhabitable. It restarted. We are making it uninhabitable. So one day, it'll restart and come again. Now, you don't have to do that, but it is a part of the life cycle. The Earth has a life cycle. This is... It's second time around, as we know of it. Now, we're waiting for the third. What do you say, Kai? She said it's the second time around, but there's been like multiple uh, mass extinction events. What obviously, like, well, is it populated because it's very, uh, what's it called? Uh, Adaptable? Um, like okay. Like for, for something yeah. I 
that everyone will want to make and just as opportunity to do it. Mm -hmm. Once the sun expands too much, there's literally nothing you could do. No. The only thing you can do is pull the earth away with like asteroids or something. But that's way off that moment. And if, if we're like two billion years in the future, we're going to be way more advanced. In a thousand years, we got light bulbs. It's a good thing that we don't have to solve this problem today. Yeah. <laughs> we just have to figure out what we're going to write about. So let's revisit the options. Remember that you have three, so you're choosing one. You can either write to Nash and his readers, is he right or wrong and why? Um, or you can choose which of the four scenarios is most likely to happen and support why that would be. Or you can uh, make this more about what is our responsibility to future generations and how we need to um, preserve the environment, again, based off of what Nash has offered. So the, the letter to the editor, um, these are some questions that you're asking yourself. And we, we do know whom, who will you be directing this towards? Yeah. Nash. Nash, pr first and foremost. But then there's also the rest of us in that, what do we need to understand about Nash? Or what do we need to understand that maybe Nash has wrong? Um, do you agree with them? Uh, you want, want to challenge him? So your thesis or your main point is just going to be, uh, he's got a good point, but, or he is totally off his, well, don't say totally off his rocker, that's informal. Um, you know, maybe there's some things that Nash hasn't considered, or maybe he's too much of a, of a pessimist, something like that. Um, rhetorical aims. So you want to make sure that you have a decent tone. Um, Mr. Short, are you still with us? Yep. Did you want to talk to this group a little bit about what your, your impression of Nash overall is and why you have that impression? Well, I just, you know, if you take the island civilization scenario, he just seems to think that humanity is a blight on the world, on the natural world, and therefore has to be separated from it. Um, you know, I, I tend to disagree with him about it. I think there's a way to cohabitate with the natural world. But, um, you know, Nash is an extremist. And uh, as an extremist, he comes up with these insane scenarios that, uh, basically um, differentiate the population of <clears throat> the human population from the natural world and you know we're part of the natural world and so uh, it just seems to me to be uh, kind of interesting the way that he is so eager to compartmentalize humanity to these islands and um, you know, like a lot of good arguments have been made so far by your students who talk about the, 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 the possible outcomes of that. And so when we're writing to Nash, and the reason I ask Mr. Uh, Short that is because the tone you're getting from it, as he said, it sounds like humanity is alive on, on wilderness as we know it. So when you write back, what kind of tone do you think would be most appropriate to give back to him? I think uh, the best kind of tone to get back to the author of this paper would be a more civil tone of intelligence and not anger and a disagreement with his idea, but accepting his idea. and but pointing out its flaws and right. telling him, show this is an idea if we were completely blind on the world, but we're not. Right. We are part of the food chain, we are part of the life. And this, we must be within it. Okay. If we remove our parts, can no longer be. We need to to live yep. and as people. Good. Um, make sure to gather the evidence for that you need. The thing about every one of these topics is that you could easily write something and not ever refer back to Nash. The problem is, is it going to be strong? Definitely not. You need evidence for this. 
and you don't have to pull it totally all from match. If there are stories that you know of, if you've seen things in the news or whatever, please go right ahead and add those. Just make sure that you cite it within the text to give the attribution. And let's say that if it's more than two extra sources, let's go ahead with the work cited to go with it. Um, it's good practice anyway. Um, then hopefully we've completed some activities that will kind of help you pull the information together that will help you make this argument. The essay, or I'm sorry, we have one more slide on this. So if you disagree with him, um, these are not the paragraphs necessarily. You can combine these together. But what I wanted to do is give you the elements that you need within that letter. So you're obviously going to review that this was the, um, and I'm sorry it's a long title, but that's just the way it is. In Roderick Nash's, Nash's article, Island Civilization, a Vision for Human Occupancy of the Earth in the Fourth Millennium, 16 October 2008. Yes, you need that all one time. But then from then on, you can say no. Uh, state your disagreement, your basic reason as to why, what are the assumptions or evidence he gives, and why they may not be either co complete or correct. Then is there any other evidence that refutes those assumptions and evidence? Provide the counter-argument to Nash. What is the counter-argument? And you will end with the actual refutation of Nash's claim. If you agree with Nash, then again, you start the same way with reviewing the title, the author, the publication. State why you agree with him and the basic reasons why. What is the evidence that was very uh, convincing to you? These are not quotes necessarily. These are the statistics that he would use or the, um, for example, he quotes Milton. So you can, you can say you too subscribe to that philosophy. Um, then you'll want to add to that evidence from your own personal observations or outside sources. Then address and refute what the counter argument is. If you're on Nash's side, then it's what, who would be going against Nash. And then finally, you're going to end with the refutation or agreement with the author. If you are both of these, you agree to some extent, you're going to kind of mesh these together and you're going to say, I agree with him to a certain degree. You know, say what you agree with and then you'll say what you disagree with. So it's kind of a blending of the two. The essays, as you know, have the introduction, the body and the conclusion. You will have this information. <clears throat> you'll get to it as you're working your way to actually turning the, the essay in. Plus it's in this one. Again, though, it's the same thing. You need evidence. What do we know now about the pattern of behavior that can predict what the pattern of behavior will be a thousand years from now? And then finally, peer review. I've included these slides for you because I guess they're helpful. So we still get new, new people coming in. So if you haven't been through the peer review process before, can kind of get a little confusing. So you have these slides. For the peer review, here are the questions that you're looking at. What is the purpose in this writing? By the way, if you don't get a peer review, what are you supposed to do? Read, your, read and review your own paper. So what questions is the writer trying to answer? What is the writer trying to accomplish? You are looking for the ethos, pathos, and logos that's in the essay. Um, how many direct quotes, how many paraphrases were there? Is there anything that still needs citation? You would want to point that out to the peer. And then the emotional appeals. Uh, what, what kind of emotional appeal is used in this paper? And then finally, what has the writer addressed the counter argument? And what was provided to refute the counter argument? Okay, are there, oh, sorry, timeline, here we go. First draft is due tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. 
the peer review will get assigned at midnight, and then those are due on Thursday. Any questions about any of this? So, Mia. Yeah. Um, so, basically, we, uh, figure, I'm going to do So, um, I'm going to talk about the three. How many Okay. What are you writing, first of all? Okay, so you're going to write the letter to the editor that agrees with now, mm -hmm. saying that this is necessary. Yeah. Then I would say, um, see, what's hard about putting the paragraph numbers on is that sometimes it limits students. And some for some students, the way that they can put things simply, it doesn't take them that long. It the, I will say that you need at least three pieces of evidence that proves what he says is true, plus the counter argument, you need something that you can refute. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So, can we um, relate it to our own, like, I'll talk about, I'll talk about the three scenarios, and I'll put three, and then, like, um, agree, and then, like, um, show how it's similar and, like, present it similar. Yes, but don't spend too much time doing that. Okay, so okay. Because it would be, so if you're just agreeing with Nash, you don't need to go into detail in the four scenarios. You can just say, I can see where, you know, we're, we may be headed to the primitive society because of this or that. So actually that whole discussion about the scenarios would only be one paragraph. Okay, so one paragraph. I'm going to make another clear about Well, remember what that with Nash, it is um, the the force, the, the garden, the four scenarios, but also it's the social contract. I would definitely uh, respond to the social contract. And then, you know, whose responsibility is it to carry on for the next generation? Yeah. So, so those three things you should hit. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you all. This is a fabulous discussion, and um, I'm going to actually embed this in the presentation, I hope, so that you'll also have a record of it if you need to go back and, and listen to it again. You don't have to, though. All right. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye.